All right, so this problem is going to take a little bit of algebra, so just stay with me. Um, here we have uh, kind of two pulleys hooked up together. We have two weights on each of the little pulleys that are hooked to each other. And this thing is going to rotate, and we want to figure out, first we want to develop a system of equations that model this motion, and we're going to figure out an expression for the angular acceleration. Now for this, just to save a little bit of time, I'm going to assume this thing rotates um, counterclockwise. Because it really depends on what these masses are, but if I'm going to solve it algebraically, I don't really know. So let's just assume it, it accelerates counterclockwise. So again, we can write three equations here. We can write uh, Newton's law equation for each mass, and we can write a Newton's law equation for the disk itself rotating in its rotational form. So let's start with those. Um, so we have the sum of the forces or on mass one is going to be a gravity force on it, m1g. Minus the ten. Actually, I should probably draw a free diagram. M one g. We have M two g. We have a tension. This cable called T two, and the tension. This cable it's called T one. So we have M one g. And again, since it's going to rotate counterclockwise, this is going to move down this way. And it's going to move up this way. So I'm going to call down positive for this, and up positive for that one. So you have M1G minus T1 is going to equal M1A. And now I'm going to make a couple other assumptions. These strings do not stretch, so all the acceleration is going to be the same. And I'm going to also assume they don't slip at all. So I can also say that the acceleration equals the angular acceleration times the radius. So I can substitute those back and forth if they don't slip. So that means this ends up being equal to M1 R1 alpha. And I have a equation in the uh, for object 2. So this time, since object 2 is moving up, we have T2 is the positive minus M2G. That's going to equal M2A, same A as M1. And I'm going to substitute in R, omega, R alpha for that. So this is going to equal M2 R2 alpha. So you have two equations. Uh, third equation I can write is the sum of the torques equation for my double pulley disc up here. So really I have I have T1 pulling down. Let's switch colors. So I have T1 pulling down over here. I have T2 pulling down over there. So I have two things giving me torques. So I can say the sum of the torques about the center of the pulley is going to be equal to the torque due to 1. So that's going to be in a positive direction minus the torque due to 2. And that's going to equal the moment of inertia of the system here times alpha or of my pulley times alpha. All right, so I have three equations. Now, the only last thing I have to do is I should um, expand my torque equation here. So this is just, so the lever arm is just going to be R1 for the outside and R2 for the inside. So this becomes R1 T1 minus R2 T2 equals the moment of inertia times alpha. Now, I'm going to keep the moment of inertia the way it is. We'll get to that a little bit later. So this is a good start. Now, I think this is okay if they're just asking you for the for equations you could use to solve this. This would be fine as an answer. Uh, if you want to actually solve for the angular acceleration, though, you have to go a little bit farther. Well, this is good for the first part. So let's uh, continue a little bit. So if you look at our equations and what's unknown, let's see. We're looking for alpha. So alpha shows up there, there. And there, so that's good. Um, we will probably know the masses, so they're okay. So that's taken care of, that's taken care of, that's taken care of. Um, I know what G is. So the mass there, the mass there, the mass there. I know the size of the pulley, so the R's are taken care of. I know what G is. So the things we're really missing are these tensions. That is what we don't have. And actually, down here, we, we could figure out what the normal inertia is. We know that. R and R. So we have three variables. We have T1, 
we have T2 and we have alpha and we have three equations. So in theory, we can solve this. Now it's going to be a little bit, we've got to be a little bit careful, but we can do it. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my two Newtons or my two sum of force equations and solve them for the T's. So starting here, bring it down here, I'm going to say in the first one, T1, I get T1 all by itself. I get T1 equals M1G minus M1 R1 alpha. And T2 equals M2 G plus M2 R2 alpha. And now what I can do is I can take those T's and I can actually sub them back into my torque equation. So my torque equation becomes sum of the torques equals, now I gotta be a little bit careful here, I got R1 times this whole thing for T1. So it's M1 G minus M1 R1 alpha minus, for R2, we have R2 times this whole thing for T2. Uh, it's gonna be M2 G plus M2 R2 alpha, and this is going to equal the moment of inertia of our pulley disc thing there times our angular acceleration. So now we're getting pretty good. We have this now. We got rid of some of our variables. Now if we look at this equation, we only have one variable left. So if I assume I know the distances or the radiuses and the masses, and I know what planet I'm on, I know everything here except for, well, I guess I got to, we'll get to this, what this moment of inertia is in a second, but I know everything except for the angular acceleration. So I can just do a little bit of um, combining variables and a little bit of math and I can figure this out. But let's first thing, what's it, what is this moment of inertia? So in our case here, we have two disks moving. So the moment of inertia is actually the, um, the moment of inertia of both those disks together. Again, I'm going to keep it in this form for now. But uh, since there are two disks, we can actually find that. So for a disk, it's going to be, I believe it's a one half mr squared. So I told it's going to be i of disk one plus i of disk two, the one version of that. So you can just add them together. So see one half m1 or m of disk one, md1 times r1 squared plus one half the mass of disk two times r of disk two squared. These masses, remember, are different than the actual hanging masses down there. So, so make sure we keep those constants. I'm going to keep just call it ID for now. If that's what it's really representing. Uh, so my last step is just going to be a little bit of, let's see, manipulation here. If I group all the alphas together with each other and bring them to one side and do a little manipulation, I believe it ends up looking something like, uh, let's switch colors one more time. It's kind of the same color. Uh, let's see. It's against me. R1, M1G, minus R2, M2, G. So I'm going to bring this over here. I'm going to bring this to the other side. Don't forget the extra R's in there in different spots. Uh, that is going to equal, uh, let's see, what do we got? You have ID alpha plus M1 R1 squared alpha plus M2 R2 squared alpha. And if I pull the alpha out of there, this equals ID plus M1 R1 squared plus M2 R2 squared. This whole thing times alpha. Now at this point I just want to stop for a second because this is kind of neat looking that we went through all this algebra and our final answer is if we look at the left hand side, this is the sum of the torques if, thing, if this was at rest. Right, so what's the sum of the torques with nothing else? With this thing not moving, will you have a torque due to M1 versus a torque due to M2? And it's just a weight, the tension in the cable is equal to the weight. 
So this here is an actual torque. This is some of the torque at rest. If we were kind of like solving for being balanced out without anything else going on, if the torques were kind of just forces applied. So that's kind of neat looking there that we can actually predict that from the beginning. If you look at over here, this is actually the moment of inertia of the disk. And this and this are really the moment of inertias of the two masses if we if we assume the masses were points. They would just they would just be MR squared at their spot where they are. So if we kind of we can actually also have predicted this. So we can actually kind of once we solve this now algebraically and look at our answer, we can kind of predict these answers in the future that we don't need to do all the crazy algebra out anymore. We know what it's gonna look like. And our final answer. If I have room to write this, is going to be. Uh, now this is if I'm gonna, so I'm not gonna do all this algebra right now because I don't have enough room on the page. But if we sub in our versions of ID over here and kind of divide the whole side by this, we get that our angular acceleration is going to be equal to R1 M1 minus R2 M2 G divided by. Now there's a lot of stuff down here. So you basically have in the bottom the moment of inertia of each disk and the moment of inertia of each mass if they were kind of point objects. So we have one half mt1 r1 squared plus one half mt2 r2 squared plus m1 r1 squared plus m2 r2 squared. Yes, I know it looks crazy, a little ugly, but if you look at all the stuff we went through, yeah, the bottom is a little crazy because we have four objects, but each of them is just a moment of inertia of each object added together. The top ends up being really, really simple. It's just the difference in torques of the masses hanging at rest.